Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore, and welcome to Reality Asserts Itself. In these interviews, I usually start with a bit of biographical information about our guest, and we talk more about why they know, why they think what they think, rather than what they think. And that's what we're going to do today. So now joining us in Baltimore is Glenn Ford. Glenn is currently the executive editor of Black Agenda Report, but before that, he was the White House and State Department and Capitol Hill correspondent, as well as DC Bureau Chief for the Mutual Black Radio Network from 1974 to 1977. He was also the founder and host of America's Black Forum, which was the first nationally syndicated black news interview show on commercial television, and many things before that. Thanks for joining us, Glenn. Thank you for having me, Paul. So let's, let's kind of start early in your childhood, and, and as, as you know, those of you who watch Reality Asserts Itself, later on we're going to talk about some of the issues Glenn is preoccupied with. But for now, let's, let me just ask, I, I personally grew up in a house where politics and news were talked about quite a bit. I mean, when I was six or seven, my parents were giving me newspapers and things to read. Uh, what, what was the atmosphere like in your house? Well, my mother and father uh, split, that is, became divorced rather early uh, in my life. Uh, their, uh, their concerns were rather different. Uh, my mother was a lifelong uh, activist, and so uh, there were always leaflets and pamphlets and discussions of how to organize people and uh, little triumphs and little victories and what she thought was, were big triumphs and big victories. Uh, my father uh, was a disc jockey in uh, New Jersey uh, and then went back down south where he came from, uh, Georgia, and became the first uh, black man to have a television show uh, in the deep south, Rock, Rockin' with the Deuce in Rockin 1958 deuce. <laughs> in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, your mother was white Irish mm -hmm. and your father was a black man from Georgia. Mm -hmm. Okay. And was he, he wasn't very political. Uh, well, they, they met uh, in the Communist Party, uh, where my mother had been uh, a young communist, and my uh, father met her uh, at one of the few places where they had interracial gatherings in Jersey City, New Jersey, at a, a Jewish community center. Uh, and uh, um, I, I believe he drifted into the left-wing politics uh, through his association uh, with her. And then there, was a, there, there has been this historical connection between left-wing Jews, black activism, I mean, in the Communist Party for sure, and, but not only, no? Well, the Communist Party, and I don't know where people get their figures, but it is estimated uh, that in the 30s, uh, the Communist Party was about 20% black. And, and that really is phenomenal when you understand that most black folks, a majority of black people, lived in the deep south, uh, where just to be an uppity and engaged black person uh, was to be in danger for your life, and to be a black communist person was to uh, commit suicide. Uh, and so uh, there, there was, you know, there was a period uh, in the late 30s and, and through much of the 40s, uh, in which you could not be a, a black uh, member of the intelligentsia without being surrounded by folks who had connections one way or the other uh, to the Communist Party, because the Communist Party was the only political organization, na national organization in the United States that was unequivocally in favor of racial integration. And so that was the window uh, on uh, an integrated society that was available uh, to black folks uh, of that time. So after your parents broke up, did you live most more with your mother, with your father? You went back and oh, forth? Oh, I was batted back and forth uh, between these, these two uh, influences, my mother being a very political person, my father uh, being deeply involved in the entertainment uh, industry. So I, I uh, developed a bifurcated brain. <laughs> uh, you, you probably heard some sirens, but we are in our temporary studio, and this is Baltimore. There will be sirens. Um, as long as they're not coming after me. So far. Uh, so I, when do you start to become aware of, of politics, of following news, that sort of thing? I think I was always aware of politics. That didn't mean that I had a political uh, analysis at the age of five, but I think I was, uh, I had a 
political consciousness, and, and, and of course, that consciousness was left by the time I was uh, 10 years old, certainly. And, and in terms of bifurcating your brain, uh, it's not just about politics and music, it's also about a white parent and a black parent. And how are you thinking of who you are and how are, how are you perceived? Well, my mother became totally integrated into the black community of Jersey City, New Jersey, so much so uh, that I believe uh, that lots of folk thought that she was just a very light-skinned black person. She was secretary of the, of the NAACP, uh, uh, totally immersed in the in the politics of the black uh, community uh, there I uh, didn't feel any any pulls from the white side because she was so uh, deeply immersed in the uh, in the black side mm. so so you growing up then you, you don't feel this kind of black white bifurcation is to use your word you felt you were black growing up in a black community and your mother was your mother and until I was in the eighth grade, I went to 100% black schools, whether in Jersey City, New Jersey, where they were de facto segregated, or in Columbus, Georgia, which was segregated uh, by law. I didn't go to school with any white kids until I was in the eighth grade. And that was very interesting because my mother, who was secretary of the NAACP, the NAACP had been fighting for open enrollment in Jersey City for uh, many years, uh, and uh, they finally won it. But nobody in the black community wanted to send their kids to any of these white schools because these were some uh, well, very hostile white people and so were their children and no one wanted to submit uh, themselves to that kind and of treatment. how much do you grow treatment. up feeling that hostility? I and mean, you don't uh, go to the white school, but how aware of you are, oh, are of that? Oh, I did wind up going in the eighth grade to this uh, white school because the NAACP members found that nobody was going uh, to take up this uh, voluntary open enrollment opportunity unless they sent at least one of their uh, children. So I, being the firstborn, was designated, and that was my first exposure to white kids, and uh, it was not pleasant. Mm. So you show up day one you've you've been in a black community and black schools and now partly because of your mom's politics you are now in a white school facing a wall of hostility a wall of hostility uh and and the crudest kind of con uh, conduct i'd ever witnessed among uh, kids. You know, when you grow up in, in segregation, uh, you imagine uh, how the, the other half, uh, the white half, uh, lives, but you don't know. And all you get uh, in terms of information is from uh, the television and other forms of white propaganda. But when I was actually exposed to these foul-mouthed youngins, uh, I was really shocked uh, that, uh, from a cultural standpoint, uh, these, these were some very crude people. That was my first reaction uh, to being immersed in a, a mostly white uh, environment in terms of school, how did crude you, these guys were. And did you want out? I wanted out, but I couldn't because my, my mother's reputation as a member of the NAACP was at stake. There had to be some kids going to these uh, mostly white schools. And did you understand the politics of that, or oh, did yeah. you kind of resent I, that? I resented it deeply. Uh, why don't you send my younger brother and sister? Uh, they haven't already established their uh, racial attitudes. Uh, maybe it'll do them some good uh, to, go, <laughs> to get an integrated education. I'm already done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's grade eight, and then I guess it's not long before you're in high school. Uh, what kind of high school do you go to? I uh, went to high school in Jersey City and also uh, in Columbus, Georgia. The high school in Jersey City was integrated, I'd say, about half uh, uh, black and, and Latino. At that time, Latino meant uh, Puerto Rican in, in Jersey City. Uh, in Columbus, Georgia, where I spent about half of my high school years, that of course, uh, the, that system was still under uh, de jure uh, segregation. And, and how much of your life experience is, is about this wall of racism, or how much does it recede in high school? Other issues come to the fore? I mean, how much is this your day-to-day -day issues? American apartheid was was the reality of the day. You don't just derive some of your uh, experience from that. You are immersed in it. And did you get active at all? You come from a very activist family, did, or your mother at least. Did, do you get active in high school? Well, my, mother would, my mother would drag uh, all of us off to uh, leaflet the housing projects and uh, whatever other uh, projects uh, she w was involved in. So. 
as far back as I can remember, there were, uh, at least in the Jersey City side of my life, uh, there were constant uh, political activities. I thought that, that was a rather a normal way to live. Uh, during the half of my youth that I spent in Columbus, Georgia, uh, a lot of that was following my father around, who was uh, tremendously popular as the first black person with a, a television show in the Deep South, as he uh, did nightly uh, record hops all over uh, Alabama and Georgia, and I got to meet Jackie Wilson and James Brown and all, and Aretha Franklin when she was, oh, maybe 20 years old, all the stars of the day. I got kind of jaded in, 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 in that regard. Mm. What felt very different world. I, I, very different. What, what felt and it, it wasn't about race that was different. It was about the different uh, avocations uh, of my mother and father. She being the political person, totally Im immersed uh, in the politics of, of, of black New Jersey, and he being uh, a kind of star. Uh, he's now, he, he's uh, a part of the Black Radio Hall of Fame uh, Museum in, in Atlanta. And do you have his voice? Because you've got a voice made for radio. Well, I don't have my mother's voice, obviously. <laughs> um, now, I, I know from chatting with you that it wasn't at a very young age, 17, you joined the Army, and this is in the midst of the Vietnam War. Um, what leads up to that? Well, I dropped out of high school uh, for reasons that are too boring to elaborate, and then discovered that uh, I had no skills, uh, and uh, there was nothing for me to do. And so I went into the Army. This had nothing to do with my politics. I was for the Vietnamese at that time. Remember, I'm a red diaper baby, but I'm also uh, a kid who had just turned 17 uh, years old, and uh, I did not feel that I had any uh, other options. Well, what did your mother think? I mean, there's, this is, there's already a pretty significant anti-war movement. Uh, the, in political households, there's, this is, that's all anyone's talking about is the Vietnam War and opposition to the Vietnam War. Well, she threatened often enough to sign me into a juvenile hall as an incorrigible child, so I, I suppose she was at a, a her wit's end with me and signed me in at the height of the Vietnam War. As a way to discipline you, a way uh, to... Maybe she thought that that was a better option than those jail. that I would have uh, in Jersey City on the streets. Mm. So, and, and, and you, were, you wanted to do this. As, I mean, you say you had no other options, but there were lots of kids in your situation that had found other options. And... Well, I wasn't thinking uh, uh, too deeply about any of this. As I said, I was a 17-year-old kid who didn't know... Uh, quite what to do. Uh, I regretted it as, as soon as I, I had taken the oath, but uh, I had three years of this uh, ahead of me. I became a, a paratrooper uh, so that at least I'd be in a unit that had some esprit de corps and uh, maybe that would make uh, the time uh, pass uh, more enjoyably. And what, in, in terms of this organized apartheid and, and this wall of racism, what was your life like in the Army? In the Army, these were political times, and uh, black folks were organizing uh, there. Of course, all of this was, was quite illegal, and, and uh, even now I'm not going to talk about the kinds of organizing uh, that we did, except to say that by uh, 1969, when I had only a few uh, months left in the Army, I was a sergeant by that time, the commanding general of the 82nd Airborne Division uh, it was a big surprise. He called uh, all three of the uh, brigades that were not uh, in Vietnam, this is in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, onto this huge uh, playing field uh, there. Uh, and uh, the first words out of uh, his mouth were, uh, I give up, gentlemen. And he conceded to all the demands uh, that had been put forward uh, uh, by the Black Brigade. Uh, the Black Brigade operated uh, at night, um, uh, conducting uh, confrontations with the MPs and then leaving slips of paper behind uh, with, uh, with the lists of, of demands. And I was part of, of that. And, uh, so these, this, this Black Brigade was a brigade was actually, you guys created. Yeah, it was actually five or six of us, but there were other uh, small groups of, of black soldiers who, were, the who were agitating. S simple things that seem uh, uh, un unimportant 
uh, uh, from, uh, from today's perspective, uh, to be able to grow our hair as long as we wanted, to have mustaches and, and sideburns, uh, but on the more serious side, uh, that, there, that uh, there be uh, the chain of command respond uh, to our complaints of, of, uh, of racism at the platoon and company level. Uh, so, the, so that uh, at the battalion level there would be a response and there would be no uh, retaliation uh, from, from company and platoon uh, now sergeants. You, you, now you joined when you were only 17, yeah. so that you, they couldn't send you into combat right away? Not when I was 17. Uh, when I got out of uh, jump school, paratrooper school in, in uh, Fort Benning, uh, Georgia, uh, there were 600 of us in that class. A handful of us were still not yet 18. And, of course, you can't go into combat until you're 18. And we were sent to uh, Fort Bragg to the 82nd Airborne Division. The rest of the class, all of it, went to the 173rd Airborne Brigade, which was in Vietnam, uh, which promptly uh, charged up Dok Tho Mountain, uh, which was a, a VC and uh, North Vietnamese uh, redoubt. And by the time that battle uh, was over, there were PFCs commanding platoons. There were only two radio operators left in the whole brigade. And essentially, the 173rd was knocked out of the war for the rest of the war. Now, I know from... Everybody that I know was wounded or killed. I know from the late 60s, talking to uh, American Army deserters who came to Toronto, where I grew up, um, especially African-American deserters, the, the level of political organizing in Vietnam amongst black soldiers, I'm not sure this story has really come out. Uh, uh, they, he, he talked about how the black soldiers had their own political organization, more or less, within the, within the uh, armed forces. And they were actually having meetings with the North Vietnamese. They were having actually, uh, he, he told me, I can't verify this, but he told me there was actually instances where black soldiers would make deals not to shoot snipers, and snipers would make deals not to shoot black soldiers. Uh, before 1965, uh, blacks were uh, taking uh, disproportionate casualties uh, in Vietnam. And this was despite uh, a, a policy uh, by the Vietnamese to uh, spare b black soldiers if they possibly uh, uh, could. Uh, but after 1965, when there was uh, a huge buildup in the American military presence, went above uh, 500,000. Uh, black soldiers reached a, a critical mass and, and essentially uh, decided not to cooperate with the chain of command. And so uh, units would not move. They, they refused to uh, allow themselves to be used as, as uh, cannon fodder. And the, uh, the black casualty rate consequently uh, went way down. Uh, it was no longer uh, disproportionate to whites. But that's because of the resistance, uh, passive at least, sometimes uh, quite active resistance uh, by the black soldiers. They were, they, they were uh, uh, open gun battles uh, in many bases in Vietnam between uh, the almost lily white MPs uh, and, and black soldiers. Uh, uh, it, 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 I, I think, uh, and I thought at the time, uh, that the collapse of the American effort uh, in Vietnam uh, was at least as much based uh, on the fact that the black soldier uh, would, uh, did not allow himself to be, uh, to be moved around <laughs> uh, by the chain of command. Uh, I, I believe that that uh, had as much to do uh, with the U.S. withdrawal uh, as demonstrations back home. And, and I think it's borne out by, by what subsequently happened. Uh, it, was, it was the Joint Chiefs of Staff, it was the Army Brass uh, that was pushing for an all-volunteer army uh, because the Vietnam was a nightmare to them in terms of having this black ghetto army on their hands that uh, they couldn't... Uh, uh, that would not listen to them. Mm. And we have seen under the volunteer army, I'll give you an, an, an example. Uh, my unit, uh, the 82nd Airborne, was 60% black at the line level. So was the 173rd. The 101st Airborne uh, was slightly uh, less black. Today, my old unit, the 82nd, is the whitest division 
in the U.S. Army. Uh, over, since 1973 with the All-Volunteer Army, uh, they, they have made sure uh, that the line units, the elite units of the U.S. Army, will not have a critical mass of black soldiers uh, who, uh, who present a wild card uh, to the Pentagon. Okay, in the next segment of our interview, we're going to pick up on Glenn's story as he becomes a professional journalist and a very imaginative and innovative black journalist in Washington. Please join us for the next segment of Reality Asserts Itself with Glenn Ford on the Real News Network.